Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you happen to be uh, in this country. Uh, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's On Aging Conversation. My name is Barbara McMillan and I'm Provincial Community Engagement Coordinator for United Way of British Columbia's Healthy Aging Team. And I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional ancestral territories of all First Nations in this land we now call Canada, on which we gratefully work and gather. The On Aging Conversation series is a collaboration between Healthy Aging Core and Help Age Canada. If you've missed earlier episodes, you'll find them on Apple Podcasts and on Healthy Aging Core Canada, the national knowledge hub connecting agencies that support and advance independent living for older Canadians. You'll also find the fall lineup of On Aging Speakers on Core, as well as delivered to your inbox if you've signed up for the twice monthly Core e news. And if you haven't, you can find the sign up at the bottom of the homepage. We encourage you to do that. In our work with CORE, HelpAge, and the extraordinary network of community-based senior serving agencies, volunteers, and professionals, we're really privileged to encounter many thought leaders and innovatives in the field of healthy aging. And so On Aging Conversations was conceived and launched to help bring some of these ideas, innovations, and perspectives to a wider audience. Each episode includes a short video that highlights a community-based organization that's making a difference in the lives of older Canadians, followed by HelpAge Canada CEO Gregor Snedden in conversation with our featured guest. And a little time for a few questions before we wrap up. And that's it. A 30-minute dose of healthy aging information and inspiration every two weeks. Meanwhile, please feel free to introduce yourself and post your questions in the chat box. And now I'll turn it over to Gregor Snedden, CEO of HelpAge Canada, and your host for On Aging. Thanks, Barb, and, and welcome, everyone. It's great to be here again. Really excited today to be uh, speaking with Kate Mulligan from the Daniland School of Public Health and the Senior Director of the Canadian Institute for Social Prescribing, um, which we'll get to shortly. Um, Help Age Canada, for those of you who, who are unfamiliar with us, we uh, support community-based initiatives through partnerships across Canada and abroad to improve the lives of older persons and their communities. And we look to convene the community-based senior services sector in Canada and very excited to be uh, soon to be announcing our official announcement of the 2024 National Summit on, on Aging uh, for the senior services community um, in Canada. Before we begin our, our uh, chat today with Kate, we wanted to share a short video from the Sage Seniors Association in Edmonton, Alberta one of our one of a, a just a fantastic organization in Canada that help age has been privileged to uh, partner with over these last few years and they're just doing amazing programs and we're going to share a little video today about their uh, on their life enrichment program which i think will tie well to our uh, conversation with Kate so without further ado uh, Amon would you please uh, fire up the video <laughs> I've been coming to SAGE for 10 years and I volunteer as a facilitator for Busy Fingers, a knitting group. I've been involved in different activities here, like learning Cree as a language. And uh, also I started oil painting and I do ballroom dancing, which I just love dancing. Mm -hmm. I started the ukulele because I heard the ukulele player singing in the cafeteria and I just went over there and joined them singing. And they said, well, you really need to practice. You play the ukulele, you know? So I thought, okay, I don't think I can play an instrument, but I do want to sing. I want to learn how. So I went to Elaine Mann uh, and I told her this. I said, I used to be deaf as a kid. And if I could look back to that kid now and say, someday you will be singing in a group. Yeah. So that's what I look forward to. That's the highlight of my life is being able to sing with people. Oh, 
Oh gosh, that super hits you right here. She had caught me off guard there uh, when she shared that story. And, and you know, Sage is, uh, they have so many amazing programs, but that's just an incredible example of one of the programs that they offer. And they offer several others. In fact, uh, another choir and music-based program that we've been engaged with them with, that's just so powerful for engaging, addressing social isolation and connecting people and, and allowing uh, older people to use so many of their faculties, their gifts, and to engage, find meaning, find, find uh, it's just uh, remarkable. So I'm really, really glad to share that program of SAGE and invite you to uh, check out their website. And certainly if you're in the Edmonton area, go, go pay them a visit. Uh, we'll pop it up, and we'll pop up SAGE in the, uh, in the chat uh, link there shortly. So uh, again, uh, really pleased to welcome Kate Mulligan with us today from the Dalalan School of Public Health, the University of Toronto, and the Senior Director of the Canadian Institute for Social Prescribing, um, which is a really exciting uh, movement and direction in Canada that hits so many notes that we're all working for to, to, to uh, aging better, to living in community and, and so on. But before we you know, dive in there, I'm just, I'm so interested, Kate, in your uh, story, a, a PhD in geography, an MA in adult education and community development. Uh, you've got some real political uh, chops there as well. Why don't you, can you share a little bit with us about, uh, you know, just yourself and how you arrived here and, and how that has sort of uh, threaded into your passion around social prescribing? I would love to, Gregor, and thanks for having me. Thanks for being here, everybody. Uh, and I'm really appreciative to be speaking to you today from Toronto, which is Treaty 13 territory uh, here in Ontario. And it's Treaties Recognition Week. So I encourage everybody to go check out if you are on treaty lands, uh, find out what more about the treaty that you're involved with or find out more about the traditional territories that you're on. So yeah, I have a nonlinear career path, Gregor. Uh, and uh, but it but it all links together with that focus on community. Um, so I really, you know, began with work on community development, uh, found my way working in health and social policy. Um, and, and at that time, the work on the social determinants of health was just starting to light up the world of public policy. So this was maybe about 20 years ago, right when I was getting started. And I was very much energized um, and, and uh, mobilized to take action when I started to see significant differences in the data about uh, different health outcomes and different life expectancy for people living in different postal codes. Uh, and for people coming from different communities. Uh, and I've never looked back from uh, really being exposed to some of that early on in my career. So I went on to a PhD in health geography to learn more about why different neighborhoods, why different communities are impacted differently by uh, barriers to health access and health equity. Um, and I've continued that all throughout my career working in public policy working at the local level in public health, working in community health, uh, particularly with community health centers, uh, and now working at the national level, trying to scale up our work on social prescribing. Wow, very cool. Well, you know, just, I, I, I'm curious, I'm interested. Um, it, would you say where there are like three or four high level bullets that where there's commonalities regarding uh postal codes and the sdh like social determinants of health can you yeah. say that you know like rural areas or uh immigrate you know high did you have any high level themes you can share with us that yeah i mean absolutely well we know that our aging population is facing very specific uh and particular barriers to health and well-being and that aging canadians are diverse right they're they we all have intersectional identity. So if you're aging and you come from a black community, for example, you're going to be experiencing potentially uh, ageism and anti-black racism at the same time. Um, if you're from a rural community, you, we know you're going to have uh, less access to the full suite of health care services that are more available to people living in urban 
urban areas. Um, and even within urban areas, like here in Toronto, where I sit on the Board of Health, we see massive discrepancies between our uh, inner suburbs and our downtown. So the inner suburbs face uh, significant barriers to health and well-being, uh, uh, poor access to quality housing and affordable housing, working in uh, insecure front service facing jobs, and so on. And they were the hardest hit during the COVID pandemic. And we have lots of maps and data that, that back that up. Wow, gosh, that's that. This could be a whole uh, on aging podcast just to chat about yeah. that. It's so fascinating, and how is such a diverse country and geographically diverse and spread out country that we are of how we can uh, uh, better serve uh, aging and and all people for that matter, especially from an intersectionality lens. Mm -hmm. So, well, let's get right to the to the to the to the uh, to the heart of the matter here. What is social prescribing? Social prescribing is a way to help better connect people to supports and services that help address the social determinants of their health and the structural determinants of their health. So we know that, you know, up to 80% of our health is determined outside of the clinical health care system. It's determined by things like our access to housing, our incomes, our experiences of racism, discrimination, uh, and our sense of connection and belonging in community, which is one that um, was a little bit difficult to communicate before the COVID pandemic, but now everybody understands because we've experienced it. Uh, so all of those factors are really important in determining our health. I think most people know that now, but our health systems haven't caught up to that understanding. So social prescribing can help us uh, do more with healthcare on some of those things. So the way it would work would be you could go to your primary healthcare provider, your doctor or nurse practitioner, or you could go to um, ideally maybe a librarian, maybe somebody in a senior servant organization, uh, somebody who recognizes that there's something going on that's impacting your health, but can't be well supported by clinical supports and services. It's not something that's going to be addressed by medication or other kind of healthcare interventions then they can refer you to somebody who might be called a link worker or a community connector. And that person takes the time to help you shift the conversation away from what's the matter with you and toward what matters to you. Mm. And together, you co-design, you co-produce a new prescription for well-being. Uh, and then this person, the link worker, uh, helps you to follow through on that. So they might connect you to a gardening group with other people. Uh, they might connect you to the ukulele and choir, like we saw in the video. Uh, or they might connect you to something um, much more in the realm of basic needs, like a food prescription or support with your housing. Uh, all those kinds of things are taken into consideration. And then the thing that I think makes this really innovative is that it then tells that story back to the health system. So we collect data about your experience of healthcare, your uh, health outcomes, and your use of healthcare services. And ideally, we've moved everybody one step at least upstream to more appropriate and more affordable services that are available in the community. And this helps us tell the story for community serving organizations of how all the work that we do has always supported health and well being, but has sometimes been interpreted as more of a cost than an asset. Now we can start to determine and say back, these are the ways in which we are creating value for people for communities, uh, and for systems. So that's social prescribing in a nutshell. Okay. So, so in terms from a from a structural or or, or a, uh, a, an investment perspective, it's about the equipping a community with um, the human resources, uh, the, yes. the connector, as you referred them, who has a particular portfolio of activity, collecting, uh, uh, you know, connecting with the third uh, participants in the program and then a, a basket of resources that they can then connect that person to. They follow up a bit of relationship building with that person, connecting them with the various resources and following up, gathering the data and making sure that, that um, it's, it's also being uh, uh, measured and monitored, the impacts of those connections. Is that? Yeah, that's exactly right. And when the services and supports aren't available, um, they can help use community development to start building new supports and services, identifying what the needs are and working together with community to, to create new services and supports and to communicate back to governments and funders about where we need more resources. Okay. Now I know it's, it's, it's early in the day here in Canada for social prescribing, but yeah. what, um, is there any, 
interesting evidence or stories that are all, that are, emer are already emerging or or maybe drawing from other places where where this where there's a little bit more uh, um, runway um, yeah so it? I'm part of the global social prescribing alliance where we work together with a number of other countries we've got more than 20 other countries now who are implementing social prescribing alongside us in Canada um, I recently went to a social prescribing event uh, at Harvard in the USA where a new uh, initiative is starting up there linking together uh, designers and implementers across that country heading to Singapore in two weeks to do the same thing for the Asia Western Pacific region and then the country that's really um, led the way on this is uh, the United Kingdom so we've worked closely with uh, NHS England, the National Health Service in England, to uh, learn about how they're doing social prescribing, uh, what lessons they've learned from the rollout, uh, you know, what mistakes to avoid, what good things to try to uh, copy here in Canada. And that's really helped us in thinking through what this could look like at a national scale in our country. Um, and then here in Canada, social prescribing is happening in many provinces across the country. So uh, in British Columbia, the United Way, working together with regional health authorities and the Ministry of Health has implemented implemented it in at least 19 different communities serving seniors. Here in Ontario, we had 11 community health centers in our initial prescription community pilot project that was really focused on equity deserving communities um, and now have continued uh, that into a bigger program that links to seniors active living centers, the links to wellbeing program through the Alliance for Healthier Communities and the seniors active living centers. And then we have other um, more localized initiatives cropping up all across the country, some that use the term some so social prescribing and some that don't. So one of the things we want to do through the Canadian Institute for Social Prescribing is learn more about what's happening in all these different places, uh, help people connect to one another, uh, find funding, work with researchers, um, and, and just uh, spread the good word about what they're doing so we can start to see this as not just a bunch of discrete small local interventions, but a real systems intervention. Wow, that's, that's, that's amazing. And um... So, so what are some things that really facilitate, like what, what really makes this work? Like this is a, you know, it looks great on paper. It really does. It looks great. I'm sold. But as we all know, when we go to apply these great programs, as you, you only discover the, 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 the nuts and bolts, the barriers and the challenges when you're in the field and, and uh, challenging your assumptions and so on. So, so what are some of the key things that, Make One of the key things program. is to not get hung up too much on the language. So we use the term social prescribing because it's very easy to communicate that we understand that there's a social or a community component and a prescribing or a medicine component. Um, you know, I think sometimes the term prescribing can be difficult for us because we don't want to be in a power relationship where we're being told what to do. So I want to really stress that co-design and the leadership of the participant are really important in social prescribing. So even though we use that term prescribing to kind of help clinicians and healthcare folks understand their place in this, um, it doesn't really mean a prescription in an old fashioned, we're telling you what to do kind of way. So social prescribing really rests in what we would call self-determination of individual people and of communities. So that would mean like ability to make your own decisions and have agency, uh, ability to see that you have an impact in the world uh, sense of belonging and relatedness in the community, right? Um, and understanding that you have the capacity within you to give back. And we see huge improvements in self-reported health and well-being for people who go on to become volunteers or supporters like the person in the video. Uh, when you remember that you have that capacity to, to give back, that's when you start to feel really good. So those core components of self-determination, I think, are really, really critical. But we also, um, I think the other thing to remember is to it is important to get health systems on board. I think community organizations really see the value and are ready to do this and are already doing many of the components. Health systems are under considerable strain um, and we might need to do more work to communicate what the value is um, and that this can bring self-determination and sense of purpose to practitioners in the health side as well. well. There's great evidence that this can help reduce burnout for people who find meaning in their work again. Um, and just they give themselves permission to be a little bit more human at work. Uh, and that's a, a wonderful thing. So, you know, we, we need, what we learned in trying to implement social prescribing is that you need champions. You need clinical champions who see the value in this and can help other clinicians get on board. You need policy champions in the same way and you need community and participant champions. So if you 
find yourself uh, interested in social prescribing and ready and willing to play that leadership role, that's what we really need right now to help tip the balance from many small interventions to uh, a movement and a big new way of doing things. Cool. Well, a two question little little follow up there. One is, you know, tell us a little bit about the the institute and and what you're doing, what your mandate is, what what it what it's providing. Um, and how people can engage. But, and second to that is, you know, if you're a community somewhere or a clinician, or you're uh, working with a, a CVSS organization and you would like to bring this to your community, what can you do? What are the steps? Who do they talk to? What, how do you make it happen in your community? So a bit of a two So we're, we're a relatively new organization. Uh, you can find out all about us at socialprescribing.ca. Um, and the, Amon, maybe you could add that into the chat box as well. Socialprescribing.ca is our website. Um, and we really have a mandate to uh, scale and spread social prescribing across Canada. So, you know, we have many different health systems working at in each province and territory, and we have different responsibilities for health across different regions uh, and levels of government. So this is one way to help kind of bridge some of the gaps between those different systems and help people talk to others that they might not otherwise encounter in their everyday life. We also have communities of interest. So if you are a researcher, you can join our research community. Uh, we have one for policy. We have one for implementers and clinicians. Uh, we have one for, we have a, a, a co-design table that's bringing together community organizations and health leaders from across the country to think about the, the important principles for social prescribing across the country uh, and so on. Uh, and we have a participant advisory council so that we are being uh, acting and working with integrity to the people who would be using social prescribing uh, with a particular focus on older adults uh, at this moment in our development. So we are doing all sorts of neat stuff, trying to make sure that we understand what the needs are and start building the tools and supports people need to do that work, as you said, Gregor, of, of implementing this in action. So if you're interested in participating in our networks, you can reach out to us on the website. Um, and we also have resources on there to help you get started. So we have a, a map of what's going on across Canada. You can add your initiative to the map. Uh, so that you're on there and we're starting to count your work and communicate that uh, outward to governments and funders. Um, and, uh, and you can also find tools and resources. So the World Health Organization has an online training that's free you can take to understand what, what is involved in that work of being a link worker or a connector. Um, and they've got a toolkit for getting started with social prescribing. We similarly developed one in one of my earlier projects for social prescribing, so that's also available. And we'll continue to roll out new supports and resources. We are working with clinicians to develop clinical practice guidelines, for example, and so on. But we're new, so we don't have everything in place yet, but we have a few guidelines that help you uh, take matters into your own hands and, and start something up in your own community. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, and I also will just, you know, as a little, a little plug here for the summit in 2024, it'll be an opportunity. We'll have, uh, you know, the entire country assembled and, and social prescribing will be a key component of our, of our time together because uh, it's, it's, it manifests in community. It's, it's so key to understanding that that it's it's that whole body that as you said 80 percent of 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 the sdh is outside of of clinical health and it's the community yeah. that wrapping that is really uh, supportive of that so we'll look forward to discussing that further well listen i we, i know we have we may have another question or two here to come up but i wanted to ask you also where do you see what what's what is it going to look like in canada uh, in five years, if, if we're able to successfully roll this out, what 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 is a real healthy social prescribing layer within our um, Canadian aging sector going to look like? So I'm going to go up ten years and then back it up to five. So okay. you know, in ten years, what I would like to see is that we have you know healthy and resilient communities, healthy and resilient older adults that are supported by a really vibrant community sector using social prescribing. So to back up to get to what we need to get there, um, we need to make sure that policymakers and funders in particular understand the value of this work in social prescribing. So we need to tell your stories. People who are listening, we need to share the work that you do. Uh, the Canadian Institute Institute for Social Prescribing uh, is not an implementer. We're not going to be doing the social prescribing. We, we are going to help you do the social prescribing and to keep telling those stories. So in five years, I would like to see a link worker available in every community 
to uh, support this work, to help map what's happening in community, to help gather data that tells the story of what's going on and helps us shift resources. Uh, you know, most of the health system funding right now goes to doctors, hospitals, and prescription drugs and supplies. Uh, that, those are important health services, but we know that some of that money could be shifted to health promotion, to prevention, to the work that community organizations have been doing for a long time. So just a reshift in, in how we think about that by using the link worker and by tracking what happens and supporting those referrals can help us go a really long way. So if in five years we've got the link that workers, then I think in 10 years we're going to start seeing really a, a more robust, uh, systematized way of thinking about community health and uh, healthier and more resilient seniors in their communities. Wow, that's really exciting. Fantastic. Uh, Barb, do you uh, do you have any? Do you, would you like to? Do you have any questions or something you'd like to? Or something from the floor? Yeah, yeah, I I do have a question, and you know, just going back, Kate, to when you're talking about purpose and um, uh, like social isolation, and we know how how critical um, it is to address social isolation, uh, but we also know there's a lot of people who aren't on anybody's radar, and you know they're. Um, they're really challenged and, and both in the day to day, um, things that can really affect them negatively, nutrition, um, poor housing conditions, um, but also when crisis occurs, like the heat dome we experienced here in BC last year, and the, the huge number of people who were um, very isolated, living alone, single, not on anybody's radar. So how, how do we deal with that? How do we reach those people? Yeah get them I think, connected. Thanks, Barb. I think that that really speaks to the need for any door to be the right door to social prescribing. We can't just locate it within primary care or health care, although that is a great starting place uh, for people who have access to primary care, at least that their their doctors and nurse practitioners um, should be aware of, uh, you know, people who are presenting with significant needs. But many people don't have access or are not using the access that they have. And so we need to have other options. So um, CISP is the Canadian Institute is backbone by the Canadian Red Cross and brings together a number of different um, pan-Canadian partners, including the United Way. And the Red Cross is really in the business of making sure that they're there for people in emergencies. So that's another potential um, gateway to social prescribing when you're finding yourself in the heat dome crisis or flooding or COVID, uh, uh, public health measures, lockdowns and so on, that there are organizations whose mandate is to do outreach. Uh, and many others, and many of you on the line will be doing outreach as well. I think that deliberate outreach part is very important that we don't wait for people uh, because when you're isolated, when you are experiencing anxiety and depression uh, or other challenges, you're so unlikely to reach out and you're unlikely also to follow through without, without support. So we need to be doing that outreach. Um, and the Red Cross now has a pan-Canadian friendly calls program, um, which is a really nice um, soft entry point for people, I think, you know, to start by receiving a friendly call, um, to start getting a little bit of connection and support, and to build from that to uh, more supports and services. There's a wonderful story from the UK uh, where uh, a group went around asking older adults, will you help us feed the birds? Um, and for people who agreed, they received a birdhouse and then they received a weekly visit to refill that bird feeder. And that weekly visit became also a social call, but then the person was also giving back. They were giving back to their community. They were supporting the bird population. They had this lovely interaction of bird watching throughout the week. And then that can be the foundation for a relationship. And relationships are really where we're gonna have uh, the magic happen for social prescribing when we're, we're reconnected with, with people and with our environments and with ourselves. Wow, that's a great story. And it's already given me all kinds of ideas around how to um, uh, implement or, or develop those kinds of really local neighborhood level connections that, that would be so valuable in this. Yeah, that's, uh, that's amazing. And, and to tie it all, what a great sort of uh, note to end on, which unfortunately we, we're, we are out of time, um, but to tie it all back to relationships and how we are such relational beings and just how important that is. Um, uh, that's, that's amazing. Well, Kate, thank you so much for taking some time for us today. It's, it's, it's you know, social prescribing, it's, it's just so exciting and we can't wait to engage, support and to see how it unfolds over this, these next few years. It's really tremendous. So thank you so much from, 
for taking some time with us today. Thank you, too. Thanks, Kate. And uh, the recording from this session will be available on CORE very shortly, as well as uh, via an Apple podcast, as I mentioned. So just watch for that CORE uh, Canada newsletter that uh, hopefully you are signed up for. And if not, the link is in the chat box. Thanks, Barb. And a note that will be our next uh, time together is on November 24th. I'll be speaking with Corey McKenzie on aging men's mental health. Uh, he's with the Aging Mental Health Lab at the Center on Aging at the University of Manitoba. And that'll be a really cool conversation. We'll be touching on a number of different things, including uh, the men's shed movement. So uh, looking forward to seeing you or being with you at noon Eastern Standard Time on the 24th. Thanks, Thanks Gregor. Thanks, Kate. And thanks, Simon.